Hello, my name is Adam Elwan and I will be your moderator today. Substitution is one of the key outcomes of the European chemicals legislation. It is the concrete result of identifying chemicals of concern and replacing them with safer alternatives. Substitution can bring a lot of benefits to your company, not only in terms of product safety and innovation, but also as a market advantage. Replacing hazardous chemicals or adapting production processes can take time and investment at the start, but there are tools and resources available to assist you. Today, you will learn more about some of these resources through different organizations who have created them for your benefit. As time is limited, we will present a few tools as examples, but most of them are available in the OECD Substitution Toolbox covered later in the webinar. Here is the agenda for today. First, I will give you a brief introduction about our strategy to promote substitution to safer chemicals through innovation. Then, Joel Tickner and Molly Jacobs from the University of Massachusetts Lowell will present lessons learned from landscaping different tools to support the transition to safer chemicals. They will be followed by Emily Connor from ABT Associates who will give you a short demonstration of the OECD Substitution and Alternatives Assessment Toolbox. Mr. Jerker Lichthardt from the non-governmental association CAMSEC will present their marketplace, better known as a dating site for safer alternatives. Finally, my colleague Ewen Brennan will introduce you to our database on chemicals and how it can be used to support you in finding safer alternatives. Now you can submit your questions through the Q&A panel in your webinar window. The presenters from today are here and ready to answer your questions. Make sure you select the All Panelists option from the Q&A panel before submitting your questions. If you want to address questions to specific speakers, mention their name at the start of your question. Note also that the presenters will answer in their own capacity and do not reflect our official position. You can submit your questions at any time until the end of the webinar. We will answer as many as possible directly through the Q&A panel, so remain logged in until it arrives. Now, if your question is not answered by the end of the webinar, you can send it to us using our contact form. The address is visible on the screen. If you experience any technical difficulties, let us know also through the Q&A panel. This webinar will be recorded and published on our website. A link to the recording and presentations will be sent to you as soon as they're ready. Okay, let's move on to the first item for today, ECA's strategy for promoting substitution. So, I will briefly go through the goals and approach taken in our strategy and explain the four action areas it is built on. Then, I will give you a sneak preview of our soon to be updated web pages on substitution and further links to other information. The main goals of the strategy are to support informed and meaningful substitution of chemicals of concern in the EU and to boost the availability and adoption of safer alternative substances and technologies. So, how do we intend to achieve our ambitious goals? Well, ECA is in a position to promote best practice and mindset through our already existing partners and networks, for example, through case studies and workshops. Another aspect is to frame substitution within a wider innovation strategy for companies by highlighting business opportunities and environmental and health benefits. Of course, we can't do this alone and working together with partners is crucial in reaching companies. Now we've decided to take a stepwise approach and frame the strategy into four action areas. You can see these areas here and I will explain them in more detail in the next slides. The first action area is capacity building on specific substitution issues and analysis of alternatives through supply chain workshops. These workshops would gather different actors of a supply chain, but also involve alternative providers, end users, retailers, and other support roles such as research and development and funding to generate a more comprehensive discussion on a targeted substitution challenge. The workshops can be used to connect people to share experience on a substitution issue and to gain knowledge and expertise from others 
who may have faced similar challenges in their projects. They can also help to identify further research or training needs. On this slide, you can see a few examples of already organized and upcoming supply chain workshops. Now, if you have topics to propose for a workshop on a specific functionality, let us know and remember to ask your industry association or member state authorities for support. The second action area is facilitating access to funding and support for research and development at an EU and at a national level. Here, our aim is to foster technical and financial support by, for example, providing relevant sources of information in an easily accessible way on our website and helping to ensure that those providing funding consider safe chemistry as a criteria. Now, whether you're providing or looking for support on substitution, you will be able to search for and fill in our list of resources that will be published on our website soon. Our aim is to have a compiled list of support providers in one place that is freely accessible to everyone. ECA hosts one of the largest chemicals databases in the world. It compiles data received from industry for the REACH, CLP and biocides regulations. The third action area focuses on how the database can be valuable, for example, in cross-checking what substance you plan to replace, avoiding regrettable substitution. My colleague Owen will give you more details about how you can use this data for substitution later in the webinar. We plan to have a workshop coming up after the summer break where we will invite participants to discuss which REACH and CLP data would be most useful to access from a substitution perspective. Please let us know if you're interested in participating. You can find a link to the survey on this slide. The fourth action area is all about networking. Here, we aim to help industry regulators and other relevant stakeholders to share experience and enhance collaboration through so-called multi-stakeholder networks. We realize the value of bringing together relevant people to exchange and coordinate substitution-related activities. ECA is part of several networks and can help connect stakeholders on substitution issues. One good example of this is a net network we have recently launched on LinkedIn, where you can exchange news on substitution. If you're not already a member, we invite you to join the discussion. Now, as mentioned earlier, we plan to revamp our web section on substitution with more information and new features in the coming months to make them more useful to anyone planning to substitute. Then to conclude, here you can find some useful links to further information including our substitution strategy in full and a recently published newsletter article that explains the strategy in more detail. We also invite you to su suggest topics for future webinars on substitution through the feedback form after this webinar. If you want to be contacted about substitution related activities or give your suggestions, you can use this email address on the screen. Okay, now it is time to hand over the floor to our first speakers, Joel Tickner and Molly Jacobs, who will share their experience with different tools to support substitution. Hello and welcome to today's ECA substitution webinar. My name is Joel Tickner from the Lowell Center for Sustainable Production at the University of Massachusetts at Lowell, and I'm joined by my colleague. Hi everyone, I'm Molly Jacobs, also at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. So we've been asked today to provide a little landscape um, that helps set the stage for today's webinar, which is focused on tools to support the transition to safer chemicals or to support substitution and what we can learn from these various tools. Um, so we'll set the stage for the rest of today's webinar presentations. So let's start with a little context about what we mean by substitution. We'll take the definition of substitution from a 2002 European Commission report, which is the replacement or reduction of hazardous substances in products and processes by less hazardous or non-hazardous substances, or by achieving an equivalent functionality via technological or organizational measures. So substitution is really a goal, but what we found is that there needs to be processes to support substitution that supports uh, the the end goal is the substitution but 
alternatives assessment or analysis of alternatives is this process of getting towards that goal of substitution. And over the last decade, there has been a growth, a significant growth in methods, tools, and resources to help support substitution planning, the process of substitution, of getting towards that um, replacement of a or reduction of a hazardous substance. Um, again, the goal here is informed substitution. So it isn't just about the act of substituting, but it's about the process and avoiding regrettable substitutions in that process by careful planning, careful and thoughtful planning. As we think about this and substitution, we've coined a term called functional substitution. So the function of the chemical matters. And if you go back to that definition from the commission, of 2002, it's really about not just chemical for chemical substitution, but it could be chemical for material or chemical for process or chemical for design change substitution. So instead of thinking about getting rid of the chemical bad, which can often lead to planning that leads to another chemical of concern or a regrettable substitution, the substitution process needs to start with a broader scoping of thinking about function and thinking about how that function can be replaced in a less harmful way, or even thinking about the necessity or the level of requirement for that function. Um, this slide provides some examples that if you're taking, for example, bisphenol A in thermal paper, the alternative may be a drop in chemical replacement, a very similar chemical as some, um, or a slightly different chemical structure. The end might be a totally different way of printing on paper, or a third way of just replacing the function entirely might be electronic receipts as an example of achieving the function that that thermal paper is receiving. So if we think about the context of tools and processes and methods to support substitution, we might think about the goal being informed substitution. Um, and then within that, there are substitution planning tools. Uh, those are tools that would help plan out and support the substitution project, or tools that connect people, um, those who have substitution problems, with those who have substitution solutions or, or um, safer alternatives, you might call them. Um, and then within that substitution planning, you might think of that there are alternatives assessment tools, and those tend to be tools focused on chemical hazard assessment, but they might take on different parts of that substitution process. The, the hazard assessment, the economic assessment, the performance assessment, the life cycle thinking assessment. So those would be tools that help support a particular element of the analysis alternatives process itself. And then within that too are the data tools, the data that would help support the, the assessment itself. Um, and we're gonna go through some of those and categorize those next. All right, and I think that's now my cue. Um, so we, we, we wanted to um, you know, put up what really is a busy slide here to show you this broad landscape of substitution support to tools that are available um, to help companies regardless of where they are in the supply chain and also to support NGOs and their research or technical assistance efforts that are supporting analysis of alternatives or even alternatives development. Um, many of the tools here are multifaceted and there is significant overlap among them. So the tools, you know, also vary widely in cost um, and, and also in terms of their methodology and their degree of transparency. Um, the tools listed here are categorized really only for the purposes of demonstrating kind of this concept of a landscape of the tools. And they're not, uh, they're not intended to be uh, mutually exclusive. So we're just kind of displaying some, I think you'll be able to see a lot, uh, you know, a, a, bit, a, a bigger list when um, Emily O'Connor kind of displays the OECD toolbox. Um, but to go through these quickly, uh, the first on this list is our connector tools. So these are the tools um, that help to connect those um, in need of alternatives with alternative providers, as Joel mentioned. Um, and we'll be learning about one of these today, um, today's webinar, ChemSec's market tool place, which is kind of highlighted in that darker blue. Um, uh, restricted or preferred lists. These are lists that include um, chemicals that are either currently restricted or categorized as high priority chemicals of concern by a government authority, either in the EU, the US, Japan, et cetera. Um, given that um, you know, we're thinking here about the global markets in terms of where a company might sell its projects. 
so or, or its products. So NGOs such as Chemsex Sinlist have also prepared um, these restricted substance lists, as have many industry sectors. So the one showed here comes from the automotive sector, um, but the apparel and electronic sectors also have RSLs. On the flip side, there's an effort to also list preferred chemicals. So those that have been evaluated as actually safer options. And an example here is the US safer chemicals ingredient list. Moving on to the screening tools, these are useful for quickly identifying known chemicals of, of concern. Um, these tools include chemicals that have been well characterized in the scientific literature. Um, some of the tools contain evaluation um, metrics or um, ability to think more thoroughly about exposure pathways. Um, some, however, are focused purely on hazard. Um, so, you know, we're not intending to go into detail on any one of these, but know that, you know, at least these five, as we've kind of um, listed them here, are examples of these screening tools. Uh, the next in this list are comparative assessment tools, um, and these tools are really designed to go deeper in terms of evaluation um, in the case of hazard on issues of toxicity, and they're comparative in, in their design. Um, and so they tend to be much more robust, much more comprehensive, and, and, and more specific to the context of an alternative, an analysis of alternatives context. Um, the last here are data tools, and data tools come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Um, they can be used to identify, you know, just substance information, um, as is in the case of, uh, you know, the ECHA data. We're going to learn more about how ECHA data can be used to support substitution um, planning and assessments uh, later on here in this webinar. Um, but they could also be used to fill important data gaps, such as like uh, for specific hazard endpoints. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. Um, so fortunately, the OECD took on the task of creating and, man and maintaining a repository of these tools, um, commonly referred to as the OEC toolbox. So you need not refer to our busy slide um, to navigate the landscape of these tools. Um, OECD has created a great resource to help you with this task, and again, we're going to hear more about that in a bit. Um, so. Uh, lastly, you know, some quick high lessons, uh, high level lessons learned um, for you all to think about um, this landscape of tools. So first, um, you know, these are the restricted substance list and screening tools are really, you know, considered what we call quick and dirty. I don't know if that's a term used in the in the EU. It's a term we use here in the United States um, about ways to avoid high hazard chemicals. Um, however, they are not designed to directly compare alternatives. In addition, they may not include chemicals, um, they only include chemicals on authoritative lists. So even, um, you know, there may in fact, in fact be options that do have, uh, you know, hazards of concern um, that might be missed and they would only be um, captured through a more thorough toxicological assessment. And that's what's actually done um, more in more detail in these comparative uh, assessment tools. So the comparative assessment tools are therefore more preferred and can really, um, you know, help, um, you know, advance assurances around um, avoiding regrettable substitutions. Um, se uh, second is that some of these comparative tools actually include kind of decision uh, making uh, uh, constructs within them. Um, and, and this includes, for example, the um, green screen that uses benchmarks to help um, guide decisions. Um, and others array data uh, in a way that the decision is left to the user. And so I think a key lesson here is that whenever there is decision making, um, in science, transparency is key, right? So um, we need to make sure that uh, these methods um, that are used and the users are, are, are always thinking about transparency in terms of the decision making that fundamentally goes into using these tools. Um, lastly, uh, there, you know, the, the, well, you'll see in the toolbox of the OECD, but there's definitely, there's been a focus over the, over the years on really honing in and developing kind of hazard related tools, right? So we have a really robust suite of tools on that front. Um, but we're kind of lacking on other fronts, um, whether it's um, uh, thinking about the alternatives context, uh, the alternatives analysis context 
as it relates to thinking about life cycle attributes, not necessarily using life cycle assessment per se, um, but how, you know, what are tools given the context of identifying alternatives that might help in that regard? And we need, I think, more tools in that way and also on other attributes of the analysis of alternatives such as performance. Um, another thing that some of these tools may not were designed to do is to compare chemical to com chemical. And so many of them are not really able to think about the broader landscape of substitution options. Um, and how do you compare, for example, a chemical to a non-chemical alternative, whether it be a technology or a material. So we're going to end our little um, presentation here by just like going back to the goal of all this. Um, so as you think about these tools as they get presented to you, um, just remember, remember the goal um, that, uh, you know, support uh, the goal of informed substitution, um, which is really to support a considered, so using data um, to help move us from higher chemicals of concern um, to safer feasible chemicals. Um, and, you know, said another way, using data and assort, uh, associated um, support and assessment tools to minimize the likelihood of unintended consequences when substituting the hazardous chemical without fully understanding the profile of alternatives. That's what these tools are, are meant to help us do. Um, and so with that, we'll move on to the next presenters. And let me um, wrap up, Molly, by just saying, as Molly said, the, these tools fit in the context of a thoughtful process, right? It, it's the tools alone are, are not uh, not sufficient. So really having a thoughtful process and, and to support that transition to safer chemicals, we, we understand that there will always be some data gaps, but it's really institutionalizing that mindset and process. And there are some good uh, resources available for that. For example, the subsport uh, database and processes uh, from Germany and the US Occupational Safety and Health Administration's Transitioning to Safer Chemicals Toolkit. Um, so, so putting the tools in the context of an overall process is, is very key. And um, certainly the OECD Toolkit brings in some of those processes as well. Great, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Emily Connor and I work at Apt Associates, a public policy and research firm in Rockville, Maryland. As background, Apt Associates has been supporting the design, updates, and maintenance of the OECD Substitution and Alternatives Assessment Toolbox over the last few years. Today, I'm going to demonstrate the design and functionality of the toolbox, which was launch launched in January of uh, 2015. Before I start, I wanted to briefly go over the guiding principles that we had in mind when designing the toolbox. Above all, we're aiming to compile a comprehensive set of resources on chemical substitution and alternatives assessments. We also want to make sure that the toolbox is useful to practitioners with varying levels of expertise, from people who are new to the field to those who are more experienced and would benefit from a compilation of resources in one spot. So with that said, um, I will start on the home page of the toolbox. Um, as you can see, we've designed the toolbox around four main portals. We have an alternatives assessment tool selector, alternatives assessment frameworks, case studies and other resources, and regulations and restrictions. Um, before I walk you briefly through these four portals, I'll point out that we do have the simple navigation across the top of the page. I just wanted to briefly point you to the about page. So on this page, we describe the charter of the ad hoc group on substitution of harmful chemicals, which was the group that kind of conceived of this toolbox and helped guide the content of it. Um, it also includes contact information. So if you have any questions or comments or suggestions on the toolbox, you can get the contact information here. I'll also briefly point you to the glossary. We wanted to have this gloss, glossary easily accessible across the entire site, which is why we put it here. And um, we've included quite a few terms here for people who may be new to the field. So going back to the homepage, um, I'm going to start today by um, 
showing you the tool selector, um, which is where we have put a lot of uh, effort into the toolbox. Um, this is um, a unique part of the toolbox in that it's designed to be interactive. Um, the way the tool selector is set up is we have information on both tools, which um, are, are resources that assist users in evaluating a um, chemical or process, and then we also have data sources as well. Um, all of the tools and the data sources, as is described in the introduction, um, uh, uh, address chemical hazard assessment and may um, address other comparative attributes as well, such as life cycle impacts, social impacts, or exposure assessment. Um, as noted here, we have created a separate page for tools with a focus on non-hazard, and I will show you this page in a bit. So with that background in mind, I'll show you um, how the tool selector works. It can basically basically be used in two, two ways. Um, you can use this um, <clears throat> filtering um, capability here in the middle of the page, or if you wish, you can just bypass this and view short summaries of all of the tools and the data sources that we have in the database. Um, we have um, separated tools. So right now, we're, I am showing tools, and we have a list here just kind of quickly scroll down to show you this. And then we also have um, data sources as well. So if you click here, you can see all of the data sources that we currently have um, summarized in the tool selector. Um, for any of the tools or data sources, you can click um, on a summary and see um, a, a short summary. Um, and then if you go back, one second, I need to actually go back. This opened up in a new window. Um, there we go. And then if you go back here, um, you can um, also compare any um, tools against each other and by clicking here and see um, side by side how a tool or a data source compares to one another. Okay, so going back to the main page, let's say I want to use um, this filtering selection because I'm not sure what tools or data sources that I'm interested in. So um, I clicked on tools, I'm, I'm interested in tools for the moment. Um, I uh, am interested in chemical substitution. I'm interested in tools that help prioritize substances for assessment, ones that may identify examples or case studies. And um, if I'm new to the field, I may really want to focus on tools where guidance is available or support and training is available. So these are just examples, of course. But um, after clicking these and, and hitting filter, I can see here um, how the different tools are scored based on my filtering selections. Um, and just to reiterate, this means that every time I change my filtering selection, these scores are going to change as well. Um, if you want to view a little bit more detail on any of these scores, you can click here and see how we've scored or how each tool scores against these different fields. Um, I, I won't go into this today, but there, but there is um, a methodology page that you can get to here um, that goes into more detail about how we scored each of these tools. Okay, so I think moving on from the tool selector, I'll go to frameworks and guides. Um, this page um, shows frameworks and guides that were initially identified in uh, the OECD meta review that was um, published several years ago. And at the moment, we have 24 frameworks and guides on this page. Um, they're summarized in this um, table, which can be filtered by different fields, organization type, name, title, and description. So if, for example, you're interested in frameworks and guides um, from nonprofits or industry, you can easily see which ones we have um, 
currently in this toolbox. So this page is pretty straightforward. Um, I'll move on to case studies and other resources. Uh, this page is broken into three main sections. Um, we have case studies, toolkits, and product rating systems. Um, we have, um, first focusing on case studies, we have 32 case studies in um, the toolbox at the moment. This case study repository is a relatively new feature of the toolbox. Um, after we launched the toolbox in 2015, we heard from many stakeholders that, you know, having a repository of case studies in this toolbox would be really valuable. So over the last year, year and a half, that's where we have focused um, most of the effort um, with this toolbox is in building um, the case study repository. Um, and, you know, our goal is to continue adding to the case study repository over time as well. So uh, the, this page um, is set up in a way that um, you can um, search um, on one or more fields, task number, author, technical function, framework, chemical industry sector, or other attributes, or you can simply scroll down and see the listing of all of the case studies. Um, we've, we've tried to summarize the case studies in a consistent way. So for each case study, we're giving the title of the study, the date of it, the chemical that was assessed, the industry sector, um, the organization, a brief summary, and then these little check marks down here show the attributes that were considered in each case study. So the goal here is to give a very quick snapshot of each case study. And then if a user is interested in more information, they can click on a full summary. So this is what the summary looks like. Um, again, we've used a common template. Um, it includes basic information, a little bit of information about the methodology of the study, and then um, the goal summary findings and impact of the case study. Um, so going back to the main case study page here, um, again, you know, we, we, when we launched the case study repository, I believe we had 30 case studies and we've added a couple. We have another one that will be going up on the site in the next week. We are definitely interested in expanding on this. So if anyone has any suggestions on case studies to include, please send them to us, please suggest them. Our process is that, um, you know, if we feel like um, they uh, uh, kind of meet the, the scope of, of this toolbox, we'll evaluate them and then we do um, provide the author of the case study the ability to, to review and kind of do a, a, a QA on um, our write-up before publishing in it, publishing it in the repository. So um, then, okay, so on the case studies and other resources page, as I mentioned, we've got these three tabs. I've gone over case studies. I'll just briefly point out that we also have a page on toolkits, which um, we're defining as websites that contain a variety of information related to um, uh, safer substitution and alternatives assessment. So currently we have about, let's see, we have 11 um, toolkits in, in, the, in the toolbox currently. And then um, go into the product rating systems. Um, these are um, resources such as Cradle to Cradle, Clean Ingredients, Ferris, Safer Choice Program, um, clearly, we don't have too many um, product rating systems captured at the moment. We have four, but we'll continue to add upon this as well. So um, going to the last portal of the toolbox, this page um, deals with regulations and restrictions. Um, the goal here was to um, compile a pretty comprehensive list of regulations and restrictions with an international scope. So we've showed here which country or region um, the regulation and regulations and restrictions are relevant to, um, the list of substances of interest, and then the kind of 
underlying legislation or program. Um, so I think with that, I've, I've touched upon um, the main elements of the toolbox. Um, we would definitely encourage all of you, whether you're new to the, to the toolbox or not, to feel free to share any ideas with us on improving it. I'll also note that we do have a link to um, a short user survey, so we would appreciate feedback in that way as well. And we're you know, definitely open to suggestions. We want to, the site to evolve and um, be useful as the field of alternatives assessments continues to evolve. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for the kind introduction and for inviting me to present. As mentioned, my name is Jerke Lichtach, and I'm a senior chemicals advisor and project manager for the Chem ChemSec Marketplace project. Please feel free to email me if you have any further questions after the Q&A session, and I will be happy to answer them, and you will have my address, email address in the end. Today, I will give you a brief introduction to the ChemSec Marketplace and how it fits into the agenda on substitution. But first, I will start by telling you what ChemSec is. ChemSec is an environmental NGO, and we were founded in 2002 and are financed through grants from the Swedish government, authorities and charity funds, as well as specific product-related funding from a wide variety of sources. However, to maintain our independence, we have never accepted any money from individual companies. Also, we normally don't target the general public with our work and we do not run public campaigns. It's in place we focus on informing policymakers and businesses. We never do any naming and shaming our companies. Instead, we prefer to highlight positive examples. Our work can be divided into three main parts. Policy work, cooperation with companies and business tools. In our policy work, we strive to improve chemicals regulation. In particular, we're working a lot on reach and the authorization process. But of course, we also look beyond the EU, what is happening on the international arena. Our business work is very much directed towards improving companies' uh, chemicals management through direct contact with all kinds of companies, from retailers, brands, all down to chemical producers. The business work is, of course, closely related to the third part, development of the business tools to both help and guide companies work in the right direction. Through our business work, we have developed a deeper cooperation with a number of multinationals in the ChemSec business group, featuring companies such as Apple, Dell, Sony, IKEA and Adidas, as well as organizations such as Euro, the European Drinking Water and Wastewater Organization. Thanks to the cooperation with these multinational companies in our business group, we have learned from each other and have quite open discussions. From the beginning, the idea behind the marketplace came from this group. It was during a meeting where we had also invited a chemical producer. Many of the companies had a list of chemicals they would like to face out from a precautionary perspective, if possible. They therefore asked why there could not be a place where all alternatives and possible substitutes were presented, like a buffet to pick and choose from. And this is why we developed the marketplace to provide such a place. We want to increase the visibility of innovations and safer alternatives to show the buffet of low-hanging fruits. The focus is on products and solutions which can be used to replace hazardous chemicals. And it's intended to be a business-to-business -to -business tool, even if many actors will find it useful. You can compare the marketplace a bit to other interactive online systems. You can compare it to eBay. Users put in ads for selling and buying stuff. However, in our case, no transactions will happen on the site. And just like Airbnb, in the sense that you can specify a number of criteria, what you're looking for. And with the dating site, Marketplace is mainly about creating an interest and find a potential partner. But the partners will probably need to explore each other more. And this will, of course, happen outside of the site. However, many of main difference between these examples and marketplace that if this is one is free of charge to both advertise and to use. And this is what the site looks like 
if you go into marketplace.chemsec.org. Anyone can do easily do a simple search to browse for alternatives and request, or you can create an ad with an alternative or a request. So what should an advertisement look like and contain? Actually, it's rather basic stuff and can be completed in 10 to 15 minutes, if you already have your sales pitch ready. We need use and function for a solution. Which substances or substances can it replace? In which sector or for what materials can it be used? Which legal requirements, standards and third-party verifications does the alternative fulfill? What is the market status? In which quantities can you deliver and when? And for startup companies and smaller companies, it might be interesting to know that this can also be indicated as well if you, for example, are looking for a pilot customer. And of course, who customers can con contact to get more information on your alternative. The more details you provide, the better your potential customers can understand your product. You also have the option to upload product images, flyers, safety data sheets, and other supporting documents to the site. In the center of marketplace are the advertisements and products and solutions to replace hazardous chemicals. Providers of solutions can put in their such advertisements and downstream users can browse them among the ads and also put in their own requests. If they are looking for a specific solution, which it cannot find already today. And then of course, other stakeholders such as authorities interested in knowing the availability of safer solutions especially to substances of very high concern. And just to mention a few companies that have already put up either an advertisement. Uh, at present, we have both big corporations such as Huntsman, Quarium and Camhours, as well as small innovative companies advertising such as Paximir and Ökobon. And we even have a spin-off from a university as well as everything in between. So there is a big mixture of companies present on the marketplace already. One of the toughest questions are actually, what is actually a safer alternative and how do you know it's better? In the scope of marketplace, we have chosen the following way forward. For criteria, we ask for no substance of very high concern properties or, or very persistent substances with known toxic cousins such as BFRs or perfluoronic substances. We will not perform an in-depth analysis of every alternative, but we will screen all submitted solutions and possibly ask for clarifications and proof of any claims of the uh, properties of the substances. However, we do not want to reinvent the wheel and certify that the wheel is actually round. Instead, we rely partly on third-party labels and certifications which also form part of the official search criteria. We focus very much on intrinsic hazards of the used alternatives, so it's not really the place to market risk reduction measures or toxic chemicals that just happen to be bio-based or from a renewable source. And we do accept any kind of safer solutions, dropping substitutes, technical solutions, new processes, new materials, if there is a safer solution, we can have it in the marketplace. And thank you very much for listening. And if you'd like to be kept updated on any changes and progress on the marketplace or any of our other tools and resources, you can find here on the slide as well. Or you would be interested in knowing more, don't hesitate to contact us or just sign up for the newsletter you can do online. Also, you have my email address here. So don't hesitate to contact me and thank you very much for listening. But good, goodbye. In this presentation, I'll be giving a brief introduction to ECHA's disseminated data and focusing on its potential relevance to substitution activities. First, I will give an outline of what is dissemination. Next, I will introduce our published data and I will focus on the data from the REACH registrations, as it is in these dossiers that the vast bulk of our published information comes. And finally, I will focus on what particular data could be of relevance to substitution and give a brief live demonstration of searching and displaying data on the ECHA website. 
what is dissemination? For me, dissemination is like a beautiful tree. It connects data in ECHA's confidential internal systems to what is public on the ECHA website. It's fed by information in our IT systems and databases and in the various regulatory lists for which ECHA is responsible. Its fruits are the various published lists and data sets made public on our website. And at the core of everything, since what we publish is substance-centric, is the CID substance identity, or SID. Every piece of published information is linked to the substance identity which is relevant. And it is this which allows us to unite and combine and aggregate our information. From the substance identity, we know all the information in all the different regulations and regulatory processes in which the substance participates. And from this, we generate such dissemination products as the substance info card, uh, the substance regulatory context, substance brief profile, and more. From this substance-centric approach, we have the entire regulatory context of the substance. This is essentially all the different regulatory activities in all the different regulations in which the substance participates. And using a substance-centric approach, we can be confident that we refer to exactly the same substance no matter in which regulatory process we look at. In dissemination, this allows us to have our tiered approach to information. Each substance has an info card which contains the highest, most general information and is aimed at the ordinary informed citizen. Building on the vast bulk of data submitted in REACH registration dossiers and in the CNL inventory and in other sources, we also compile, where possible, a brief profile for the substance. This is aimed at more expert users and contains summaries of, for example, scientific and administrative data in relation to the substance. And finally, the source data for both of these is the different published lists that ECHA is responsible for maintaining. This tiered approach to information is built into the functionality of our website and allows users to start from anywhere and cross-link to wherever is relevant. For example, clicking on a highlighted substance name will always bring you to the substance's info card, no matter where you find it in our website. As of today, we have 230,000 public regulated substances on our website. The vast bulk of them are chemical substances, of course, but we also have, from the biocides regulation, things like viruses, bacteria, and even regulated dusts. From these substances uh, of the chemicals, we have about 90,000 well-defined substances which have a single assigned chemical structure. We have another 90,000 which are complicated and do not yet have an assigned structure. We have UVCBs, we have cases where the substance identity is confidential, and of course we have things like regulated groups, uh, lead and its compounds, subject to restriction for example. So, in more detail on our published data, we have here in the uh, section of our website, the key regulatory lists highlighted in one single page under information on substances. Here you can find the most important regulatory lists from the four regulations for which ECHA is responsible. REACH, CLP for classification and labelling, BPR for biocidal active substances and products, and PIC for prior informed consent for import and export. Uh, first, of course, is the EC inventory, compiling the substances known to be on the EU market before reach. Then, in ECHA's activities, we have the dossier evaluation decisions. Uh, these are the cases where ECHA has evaluated a dossier on a substance submitted by some company in Europe. Uh, the core app list might be of relevance. These are cases where a substance has been identified as potentially hazardous and is being assessed by an EU member state. So I would guess that substances on the core app list are cases where a substance might need to be considered for substitution. Likewise, the candidate list of substances of very high concern, or SVHCs, these again are cases where a substance has been identified as uh, hazardous and where it might be eventually subject to authorization 
in the EU market. Uh, after the candidate list, a substance can end up on the authorization list, Annex 14 of REACH. And on, once on this list, some or all uses of the substance might be subject to authorization. So these are cases, again, where a substance might be relevant for substitution. Then there's the restriction list. So use of the substance is entirely restricted in the EU. This gives also the condition of the restriction and any other relevant data. Uh, from the CLP regulation, the key list is the table of harmonised CNL. So these are cases where, again, a substance is hazardous and has a harmonised classification and the labelling agreed at EU level. The CNL inventory uh, is the repository of all notified substances which are hazardous, uh, no matter in what quantity they're imported or manufactured in the EU, and contains mostly self-classifications by industry. So there can be uh, discrepancies in the notification of data on a substance. From the biocides regulation, we have the list of approved uh, active substances or substances for which approval is being sought. From the chemicals subject to pick, we have the list of substances where there is an export ban or control on the substance. And finally, we ha under REACH, we have the list of substances registered. So this means that the substance is manufactured or imported at over one tonne per year in the EU. And as part of the registration process, companies have to submit to ECHA a dossier of information on the substance. And it is in this particular list that the vast bulk of the information submitted to ECHA is made public. As of today, we have about 18,800 substances registered, but since the final REACH registration deadline is at the end of May this year, by the end of that we expect to have all substances over one tonne completely registered. Uh, you can see, looking at these statistics, that the rate of registration has increased in the run-up to the final deadline. And, for example, in the last month alone we have had 1,000 new substances registered and dissemination is keeping up with the load, so as soon as a substance is registered, you will be able to find it on the ECHA website. So next, we focus on the publication process for REACH registration data. <coughs> Under REACH, as I said, companies have to submit to ECHA a dossier of information on their substance, proving that it is uh, safe to use or used safely in the European Union. So once the company has submitted the dossier to ECHA, it's detected by our systems as ready to be published, because by law, every single registration is subject to dissemination, without exception. However, what's specified in the regulation is that some information uh, must always be made public, some information can be claimed confidential by the registrant, and some information, of course, can never be published. So every dossier goes through a filtering process to leave only what is public behind. Another concept in REACH is the joint submission. So if multiple companies are registering the same substance, they are required to share data together, to come together in a joint submission and submit jointly their information. In this case, the same process applies to the lead dossier in which the bulk of the information is contained and to the member dossiers where any additional data relevant only to the member is contained. They all go through a filtering process and all the confidential information is removed by our systems. Once the step is complete, the unique set of all public information is combined and aggregated together in the next step. And this then is what's published to the ECHA website what you'll see in our published fact sheets. So once on our website, the data is also linked to the OECD ECAM portal, where regulatory information from OECD member states is made available and combined. And the data is also calculated and combined to create our info cards and brief profiles on substances. So the source of data for what's published for REACH registrations is essentially derived from what's stipulated in the REACH regulation, firstly. 
then there is ECA's interpretation and policy on what the regulation actually means. And from this, there is a lower level implementation going into the technical details. <coughs> REACH stipulates that registrations are made in the Euclid database format. So the basis for everything we publish is Euclid dossiers. And in a Euclid dossier, there's about 20,000 different fields, approximately. Per field, in dissemination, there are three possibilities. The information is always published, it's published if not claimed or flagged confidential, and it's never published. So what happens in our system is that per field, we have an IT filtering rule, which is programmed to know what the field is and what are the conditions under which data might or might not be published from that field. From the regulation, the information that's always published is clearly specified. So the substance identity, classification and labeling, scientific data results, uh, DNLs and PNEX for the substance, guidance on safe use, and so forth. In the regulation is also specified the information which can be published unless the registrant has claimed it confidential. <coughs> this goes into more details, and if the registrant wishes to claim it confidential, they have to pay for the claim to be assessed, and they have to justify the reason for the claim. And if the reason is uh, not sufficiently justified, or if the assessment of ECHA finds that it is uh, not valid, the claim can be rejected, and so the information can eventually become public on the ECHA website. This assessment process normally takes between six months to a year after the dossier has been submitted. Then there is information which is, uh, let's say, in the gaps of the regulation, which can be, is considered to be volunteered if it's not flagged confidential by the registrant. So this is information not specifically excluded from dissemination, but not required to be made public. And finally, there's the category of information which is never published. So this is, for example, specific details of manufacturing processes, names and addresses of animal suppliers, of scientists, of company officers, and so on. This information will never be made public. So next, we will take a look at what is published and what is uh, most relevant for substitution. So I will show you where to find it on the ECHA website and how to search uh, using our powerful search features. So everything that is relevant to the ECHA for searching can be found in the general website search for chemicals using the advanced search for chemicals or in the information on chemicals page under reach registered substances. And now, if we uh, open the ECHA website, I will show you what you can do. So, from the ECHA website main page, you can see here the simple search for chemicals. Here you can search by any chemical name, EC or CAS number or identifier that you choose, and you should be able to find uh, the relevant results. Of more interest, though, might be something like the advanced search for chemicals, and here, you can look for chemicals from the registration dossiers by their life cycle step, for example, or from their use descriptor categories. So the product category, where the chem or what the chemical is used for, the sector of use, so in which sectors the chemical might be used, manufacturing, agriculture, and so on. For article categories, so in which articles the substance might be ending up, and so on. Uh, this, recall, is linked to the, if the substance is registered, you will have data here. In the advanced search, you can combine this type of searching with information from the CNL inventory. So look for the physical, environmental, or health hazards of a substance. There is also the critical properties of concern of a substance, which are calculated uh, in the info card, indicating whether the substance is carcinogenic, mutagenic, toxic to reproduction, is a sensitizer, is PBT. And in the advanced search, all of this information is linkable and searchable. If we look next at the information that you will find in a registered substance fact sheet, this is the page for registered substances. You have a quick link also in the menu directly. And you have powerful search options here also. So, for example, you can search by administrative data, 
where the substance is registered, the publication dates, the registrant company who has made the registration of the substance. You can search by substance data, the tonnage of the substance, so to see high volume substances above 100,000 tons at the click of a button. You can also see whether a registrant has indicated if the substance has a nanomaterial form, if it's indicated as PBT, if there's a chemical sa safety assessment done for the substance, and so on. In the registered substance section, you can also search by the life cycle and use of the substance. So again, you can see in which life cycle steps the substance is used and the use descriptor categories, the same as in the advanced search. So, for example, you want to indicate or find a substance which has consumer uses, you can do so directly. Consumer uses and more than 100,000 tons manufactured or imported, and you find there are 372 results in our registered substance data. So you can see that the search options are quite powerful and allow you a lot of flexibility to find what you're looking for. So points to consider though are that the searches are only fed by the information which is made public. If you're interested to find what this might be, the simplest way is to read either the manual on dissemination and confidentiality on the ECHA website. Or alternatively, if you have your own Euclid data set, built into Euclid is the dissemination preview tool, which allows you to simulate the same filtering process that occurs during publication to our website. So if you have a data set in Euclid, you can see which information from that data set would be made public or not if it's disseminated on our website. Uh, one consideration is that if you look at the use section where most of the information relevant to substitution could be found, is that, for example, the technical function of the substance is not currently made public. Uh, this is a policy decision based on how the filtering rules are decided by ECHA's management uh, in cooperation with our stakeholders and the Commission. So if ECHA gives focus to substitution and prioritizes the functions of the dissemination website for assisting in substituting chemicals and finding other chemicals with the same uses, this could be looked at in a review of the dissemination policy which is upcoming in the next year. So if we look at a specific fact sheet example, we can see what type of information you can find now. So, to find a good example, if we look for a high volume substance, which would generally have more data. So, a substance above a million tons, where we have consumer uses. And let's say where the substance is a PBT. and we have four results. So, lead. That's so, if you open the fact sheet for the substance, you can find here the different sections which correspond to what's in a Euclid substance data set. General information is an, an administrative overview of what substance you're looking at, the different trade names for the substance, the composition is provided by the registrants and the identities of the registrants of the substance. <coughs> Classification and labelling and PBT assessment indicates what the registrants have provided. Manufacturer use and exposure gives the substance life cycle with uses and uses advised against. And here you can see, as we searched for, the substance has consumer uses, lead ammunition, you see that it's uh, made in base metals and alloys. Its service life is relevant to the use, yes. Here you find the details that have been provided by the registrant. And what you will see here are all the unique uses from all the different registrants. Then, of course, you also have the scientific data available, the physical and chemical properties, environmental fate and pathways, ecotoxicological information, toxicological information, guidance on safe use, 
and any the chemical safety assessment report, the fact that one has been done for the substance. You will never find the actual chemical safety assessment report itself, as this is confidential and not published. You will only see whether or not such a report has been compiled for the substance. So you see that under uses, essentially what is published are the description provided by the registrant and the use descriptors at the moment. As I said, this is potentially subject to a policy review and might have more useful information, but for now, this is all you will find. So, as I mentioned, the future is that there's a policy review upcoming, which may allow us to publish more and more useful information. And if ECA puts a focus on substitution and promoting it, then its data requirements can be taken into view and we can see how best to promote uh, publishing the data that's relevant and allowing searches for potential substances to substitute a specific substance. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to any feedback. We are at the end of the webinar. I hope you found it useful and that you have gained an overview of the available tools to assist you in your substitution projects. Thank you to our panelists and presenters, and most of all, thank you to all of you for joining us today. A link to the recording and presentations will be sent to all of you shortly after the webinar. We will close the webinar at 4.30 Helsinki time. If your question is not answered through the Q&A panel by the time the webinar closes, send it to us using our contact form. When the webinar closes, you will be automatically redirected to a short feedback questionnaire. Please do take the time to share your comments and suggestions with us so that we can further develop and improve our webinars to meet your needs. See you again in one of our upcoming webinars. Thank you.